do, I'd like to introduce uh, Jeff O'Dell. Um, not only is Jeff a dear friend uh, to me, um, but he is one of the elders, uh, one of our lay leaders here at Journey Church International. I love that our elders at Journey um, don't sit in a boardroom in the back kind of just, you know, spinning the, spinning the dials, but they are actively engaged um, in ministry um, with people. And uh, Jeff is one of our elders. He is a um, grief <clears throat> counselor and is um, eminently qualified to walk you through uh, the content this morning. He produced it, so uh, he's definitely qualified to do it. Um, he's not only is a great friend, um, he's been a pastor and a church planter and a grief counselor and a minister for uh, a long time. Yes, he earned the, the gray on top of his head. <laughs> yes, I did. Yes, did. Okay, so anyway, um, let's welcome my friend Jeff Odell to come on up. Thank you, Mike. I, uh, those of you that know me know this is not my normal voice. So um, about uh, three days ago, coming back from the north part of uh, the country, uh, we drove up to see our son, and I picked up just a little scratchy throat. And then by Thursday... I had very little voice, and yesterday had a little bit less, so actually I'm feeling good now. I've got more voice now than I've had in a while, but I will just warn you that uh, um, in all the, my years of pastoring, I would do this about once a year, and I've already told Alex I'm going to talk really soft, so if you can't hear me, tell him, don't tell me, because um, if I project or try to talk to the back row, um, it will get ugly. I will just tell you that I'll get in a coughing fit. And uh, I've already told our table leaders, if I get to coffin, I'll just say discussion, and we'll go right to the discussion, even if we haven't covered the topic yet. So uh, just uh, bear with me. We're going to try to get through the next uh, two or three hours together. First of all, I want to say thank you for coming. Um, I know that um, when we were talking about putting this together, I told, the, uh, I told Pastor Christian and I told uh, Mike, I said, um, you know, we, we've done these before. And we did topics like apologetics, and people are like, man, I want to go to apologetics class. That's awesome. I can't wait to get to an apologetics class. Uh, that's an attractor. People are attracted to apologetics and, and breaking down the Bible and those kinds of things. Grief and loss, that is not an attractive topic. That is a repellent. Uh, most people are like, no, I don't want to talk about that. That's the last place I want to be. And last thing I want to do on a Saturday morning is sit and talk about grief and loss. But I recognize in this room that um, you're here because you're hurting. People don't come to a group like this if, or to a workshop like this unless, just, if, unless you're, your heart's just broken. And so I recognize that. And um, so kind of what I'd like to do is maybe there's some anxiety, a little fear about what we're going to be doing today, maybe a little nervousness. Maybe even some of you got here and parked your car and weren't even sure if you were going to get out of the car or not. Um, so I just kind of want to pause. Just for a second, um, if you want, you can close your eyes. We're not going to do anything weird or anything, but uh, just um, just take a couple deep breaths, okay, with me. Um, just kind of what we do is, and there's scientific research that talks about slow breathing helps us relax and clears our mind and gets us thinking. So just about, uh, you know, breathing in through your nose on a count of four, just kind of a, and then breathe out through your mouth on a count of eight. And again, one more time. And then I want you to do something else. I want you to take this arm right here. Take your right arm, okay? Put it around you like that. Take your other arm, put it around you like that. Some of you need a hug this morning. In the days of COVID, we can't do that anymore, hug each other. So we uh, just kind of give yourself a little bit of a hug, okay? Rub your arms a little bit. Kind of feels good, right? Um, and just uh, there's a actually if you hit a website sometime when you've got more time, hit a web, uh, website that talks about havening. You might want well to look up the term havening, H-A-V-I-N-G. Gives you a lot of tools that when you're just kind of stressed and and struggling a little bit, kind of to refocus on just making yourself present and and understanding the presence around you uh, might be something to look into. So. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna walk through this little booklet I've given you together, and um, Mike said I, I put all this together. Actually, I stole most of this, so uh, 
Um, I learned years ago a good preacher steals most of his own materials or steals most of his good material. But uh, so we're going to be borrowing from this and uh, from a lot of different authors and writers and who have a lot more experience in grief than I do. But I have been working in grief and loss for about the last 10 years. And um, I love what I do. It's a, it's a real discussion killer typically. You know, yet people ask, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a plumber. I'm an electrician. I'm a lawyer. I'm a doctor. And I say, well, I talk about death and dying all day on my job. And uh, so they usually go get a cookie and they don't come back to my table, you know. So I'm used to it. So if nobody wants to talk to me when we're done, I understand. But uh, I am here to talk with you when we're finished, if uh, as long as you want to or need to today. The um, We're going to break up the... Uh, our time in three sessions. First, we're going to talk about uh, how important it is to understand that we all grieve differently and uh, learning how we grieve and that there is no right or wrong way to grieve. It looks different for everybody. You've probably already figured that out uh, pretty fast if you're around your family and, and other family members. And it's we, it's really easy to fall into this trap of, of saying, well, they're not doing it right, or am I doing it right, or who's doing it right? And uh, so we want to talk about that because especially as you gather for the holidays, I want to keep all of this in context with the holidays especially as you gather for the holidays this year, you're, you're, you know, some people may not want to gather. Others may want to gather. Some may want to do it up big. Some may want to scale it back a little bit. You may have already experienced a little bit of this uh, as, as you went through the Thanksgiving season. And uh, some family members were just like, I don't want to be there. I don't want to be a, a part. And so um, it's really important to understand why that's the case, and why that happens. My coworker, um, this little this first little green box. I heard my coworker say a few years ago, and we came up with this little diagram, says there are so many variables to experiencing loss. Consider if everyone has a unique thumbprint, everyone has a unique heart print. I don't know if you ever thought about that or not. You know, I don't know how many people in the world is, what, 8 billion people or something like that in the world. And every one of us has a different thumbprint. And as you, you know, to think that everybody is so different. I'm, I'm married to a twin. My wife is a twin. And I can tell you that uh, even though she's a twin and, and a lot of life experiences with her and her sister are very similar, uh, their personalities are completely different. We hung out with them a little bit this past weekend. And uh, their thumbprints are different, but there's a whole lot of other things that are different about them as well. I have twin grandbabies, and uh, they're as different as night and day. They're only three and a half years old. But uh, already they've had different life experiences from one another. The little boy had, a, had, a, had some surgery some time back and had a little piece taken out of his little nodule taken out of his throat. Um, his sister didn't experience that. So already their life experiences are different. And because all their life experiences are different, even in the same family, we don't all experience the same things. Because of that, our, our grief is different. We, ju we just approach things differently and we see things differently. So because of that, all relationships are different as well. I grew up in a large family. Uh, I'm the youngest of six kids. Um, but when my parents passed away, my wife and I had many discussions about how that, and me and my siblings had discussions, and we would tell stories about dad, and, and they would tell one story, and I'd say, well, I don't remember that story. And they'd say, oh, yeah, that was before you were born. Or, you know, well, well one time dad pulled me aside, and he really got onto me for this. Well, he didn't do that with the other kids because maybe he didn't feel like he needed to. My point being is that our relationship, even in a, in a family, all relationships are different. I can never say to you and I can never say to anyone else, I know exactly how you feel. I can't because your relationship with your dad was different than my relationship with my dad. Your relationship with your mother is different than my relationship with my mother. Uh, I'm different than you. Our parents were different from each other. Uh, the best I can do is say, I know how I felt when I lost my dad. I know how I felt when I lost my mother. But, um, I, but I can never say to you, I know exactly how you feel. And nobody else can say that to you either. Uh, although they'll try. I, I, we could spend an entire hour just talking about all the things that people have said to us that didn't help, right, in our, in our grief and loss. Things like, well, it's been two months. How come you're not over it by now? You know, what's wrong with you? Or, uh, you know, this is what you should be doing. You, know, you need to do this. You need to do that. Or... Um, you know, well, at least they're in a better place. I mean, you know, what's so bad about this place, right? <laughs> this is where loved ones are at. You know, all the things that people say. And we could spend an entire hour d talking about that, discussing that. Um, in our eight-week classes, we do spend a lot of time there, but we won't this morning. But uh, So I'm not here to tell you how you feel or how you should be feeling. You, you already know that, okay? And nobody else knows that either, especially your family. In the context of our family, they, they don't know either. 
Many times with, uh, with loss, H. Norman Wright in his book talks about all the secondary losses that happen when we lose someone in our life. And uh, after he lost his wife, he wrote this. He said, he tells us that uh, uh, his, his death brought, the about, brought about the loss of a friend, a handy person, a lover, a gardener, a companion, sports partner, checkbook balancer. <laughs> if my wife, when my wife dies, that checkbook will never be balanced again. I'm just going to tell you that right now. She still does it, does it the old-fashioned way. She gets the bank statement. The only thing that's changed is she goes to the bank statement online instead of getting it mailed to the house, but that's the only thing that's changed. And she gets it and she balances it to the penny every day. Uh, or not every day, sorry, every every month. We um, have a good friend of ours, a financial planner, and we get this big giant packet thing from him every quarter. And he says, don't worry about trying to balance that. Nobody can do it. Wrong. Um, she does it every month. And when they're wrong, she calls them and lets them know that they missed that dime that, that we should have gotten. So uh, I'm in trouble if that happens. Uh, my mechanic, encourager, business partner, Aaron Person, uh, tax preparer, provider, cook, bill payer, laundry person, confidant, mentor, prayer partner, source of inspiration, teacher, counselor, protector, organizer, navigator, motivator, memory sharer, dreamer, the world we knew. You know, we don't just lose, lose the person. We lose all the things that that person meant and all the different roles they played in our life. And so, and so because of that, it's, it, that grief is, is so different from all of us, for all of us. Um, Kenneth Doka did some research and put together a um, kind of a concept, what he calls the difference between uh, grievers and the fact that some of us are intuitive grievers and some of us are instrumental grievers. Um, by that, we mean the difference being that um, just the way we express our grief, okay? An intuitive griever is someone who wants to share and talk about their feelings, express the way they're feeling. Um, an instrumental griever may not want to talk about their feelings, but they'll they'll start a campaign against cystic fibrosis or they'll start a campaign against, uh, uh, or they'll build something maybe in honor of their loved one. Um, I tell this story in my groups, so if you ever come to one of my groups or if you've been to one of my groups, you'll hear this story again. But uh, probably the most classic example I ever had of this was early on in one of the first groups I ever did. Um, I had a lady who came to my group and we we, um, we talked through the, the grief and, the, and, and through, the, through the program and, and she said... Um, uh, she called me one day and she said, I'd like for you to come. This was about six months after the group had finished. She called me and said, would you come by the house? I'd like to talk to you. And she said, besides that, I made a pie and I'll, I'd like to give you a piece of pie. Well, that was a given. I said, sure, I'll be there. Uh, so I showed up at the house and um, when I got to the house, and, and I remember during the group, she would always say many, many times, she would say, I wish my husband would come. I just wish my husband would come. I just wish I could get him to come because he won't talk about this, this loss. They had lost a son, by the way. Uh, who was 50 years old. This couple was in their 70s. And uh, I, I showed up I showed up the house, and when I got there, the, the garage door was open, and I, and I went up and introduced myself. I said, uh, I said my name is Jeff. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm here to meet, meet, your, meet your wife, and we had some schedule. He said, I know who you are. He said, you're that grief guy. I, I'm thinking, wow, my reputation precedes me, right? Uh, this is not good. He's, he already does it. He's a little standoffish here. And then without saying another word, he said, let me show you what I've done. It was almost as if he was saying, she keeps telling me I'm not doing this right, but let me show you how I'm doing, handling my grief. And he walked me around the corner of the house. We went down a hill into the backyard. And when we got back there, I can, I can only describe what I saw is something that rivaled the hanging gardens of Babylon. I mean, this guy had built uh, flower beds and trestles and uh, put gnomes and globes and, and all around his backyard. He probably had seven or eight different flower beds that he had made. And in every single one of them, he had a little sign. And in the, on that sign, it says something to the effect. They were all a little bit different, but it would say something to the effect of, in, in, in honor of our son, Jeffrey, which another reason I'll never forget that in the same name. And he... Um, and he walked me around and told him about this, and he was telling me what these flowers were and what these flowers over here were and, and, and describing them and talking about them all. And um, he told me later, he said, uh, um, um, he, he said, uh, uh, you know, he just walked around and told me, and someone just had the name and the date of birth and date of death. So finally he walked me back inside the house, and I spent time with his wife, and we talked. And then a little bit later, he, he came into the house through the kitchen and grabbed a kitchen dining room chair and pulled it about halfway into the room, which I thought was significant. It was kind of like... Okay, I'll sit out here, but I don't want to get too close to all this. 
ooey gooey feeling stuff. And his wife's just pouring out her heart and crying and sobbing and Kleenex is handy and the whole bit. And um, as I got ready to leave, we, we talked. And of course, I had my piece of pie. And then he left. He walked me out to the car and he said, Tell you what, why don't you come back next spring? He said, I'm going to start on the front yard. And um, about a year later, I was in the neighborhood and I thought, Well, I'm going to drive by that house to see what he's done. And I drove by. Sure enough, he had a tree planted, a flower garden around that tree. And uh, from, the, from the road, I could see a little sign. I couldn't read it, but I could see a little sign. I already know what it said, something to the effect of in honor of our son, Jeffrey. Um, classic example. She was an intuitive griever when to talk about her feelings, emotions, and share and cry and talk. Um, he was very instrumental, um, built something, created something all in honor of his son. You couldn't have got him to come to a grief group for all the money in the world. And it, had he come, he wouldn't have spoken a word. He would have sat there. Every once in a while, I'll get couples who come to my group. Usually one's very talkative and one's not. It's just the way, the way we're made, the way, way we're designed. And, um, and so it was very, very, uh, very, very um, uh, clear how this couple shared their grief. I had one gentleman who built a 50-foot water or a windmill in his backyard decorated with Christmas lights, and they're on year-round. His neighbors are thrilled by it, as you can imagine. He, he, I drove out one day, and like from the top of the hill, I could see this, this windmill. But on, the, on that windmill at the bottom, he says, this is in honor of my wife, Sharon. And he's put the, put the name and the whole bit. And um, it's incredible to see. But, uh, you know, but he wouldn't come to a grief class. He wouldn't sit and talk about his emotions. He wouldn't do homework assignments, those kinds of things. But, but he was showing his grief a different way, classic instrumental griever. And in your family... As we talk about these things, I want you to think about who in my family is the instrumental griever? Who's the intuitive griever? If they're an instrumental griever, they might not even be here because they're like, no way uh, am I going to do that. But, um, but, but they might be that instrumental griever who says, I want to honor mom, I want to honor dad, I want to honor whoever I've lost this year, but I want to do it a different way. If you have kids, you probably already know who that is amongst your kids. You know, one kid is talkative and loving and all that kind of stuff. The other one's like, yeah, I don't want to talk about this. Uh, I have two boys uh, who are now ages. I was trying to figure this out the other day. Bear with me one second here. I think my boys are 37 and 35. Don't tell my wife I don't know the answer to the, the question. But uh, uh, ever since they were born, people have asked us if one of them's adopted. They don't even look alike. Okay, and uh, I always tell people, yes, one of them's adopted, but don't tell them which one. Okay, because we're not telling. But uh, um, we've had we've had one son who's just always, always, always has just wanted to cuddle up with us and hang out with us, and comes home and tells us every. He come home from dates and tells us everything that happened on the date. Okay, he's a weird kid, but you know he, he uh, he's short, he's redheaded, he's five foot six, doesn't like I said, doesn't even look like me or his mom. And uh, then we, our other son's five nine. Kind of, kind of slender built. The other one's more short and stocky. Um, we have to pull stuff out of him, drag stuff out of him. You've probably got kids like that too. When my when my nephew died about 12 years ago, I remember going to the hospital, and we took both boys up. The one son, the youngest, wanted to sit right there on the hospital bed, sit by him, hold his foot, kind of hang there, be right there, right by him the entire time. The other one said, "Dad, can I just sit out in the in the in the waiting room? Y'all just let me know when he's gone." And still today, they're both like that. The, the um, younger one wants to be right there with you in your pain. The other one, he, he, he cares, he's concerned, but, but he, and he'll build something fantastic in your honor when you're gone, okay? I don't doubt that, but, but he's just not going to get too close. Um, came from the same family, same parents, but just totally different in their personalities. Gary Smalley years ago did a book, did a, some video series on personality traits, I don't know if any of you remember this series or have seen it or talked about it, but he described everybody, you know, they've got all these fancy stuff. What's the, what's the big personality trait thing that's out the, the yeah, the Enneagram. I, I'm not that deep, okay? I'm not that complicated. I can't, I can't barely say Enneagram or don't know what it means. I like Gary Smalley, okay? Give me four animals that make sense to me, okay? The lion, the beaver, the otter, and the golden retriever, Okay. And all of us pretty much follow the personality of one of these four animals, okay? This makes sense to me. I'm a kind of a simple guy. The lion's that person who walks in and is going to take care of a project and get it done, and they'll have it done while you're still talking about it. Um, the beaver, he'll think a lot about it. He'll be very analytical. Um, he'll get his project done, but um, 
it just may take him a while, right? Um, I had a good friend of mine who was a, um, um, he was the second, he, he was working on his chemistry doctorate at the University of Arkansas, and he'd been working on it for four years. And his wife was like, why don't you just turn that in? He said, well, it's just not quite right yet. Just not quite right. There's 24 questions Gary Smalley uses for these personality styles. He, was a, he answered all 24 of them as a beaver, came out a beaver. And I don't know if he ever turned in that project. I don't know. We ended up moving away from Arkansas, and I never saw him again. He, he may be still working towards that. Uh, the otter, otter, you, you've been to the zoo. You've seen otters. Man, they're fun, aren't they? They are a blast, okay? Uh, they have a 1,000 friends. They know each of them about a eh, quarter of an inch th- thick, right? But, um, but, they, but they love everybody. You know, they're the life of the party. They walk into a room. They liven it up, okay? Um, they're, they're otters. They have a blast in life. Uh, the golden retrievers, they have about three friends. But, boy, they know them to the depths in their heart. And they are lifelong friends. Otter doesn't have time for anybody like that, okay? A lion will just trample all over them. And uh, the beaver will say, well, I'll think about being your friend. I'll get back with you in about seven years, okay? Uh, it's just the kind of way off. And all of us kind of fall in this, these personality traits a little bit. Um, the lion, we used to say in church business meetings, the lion is the person who goes and does the job while the church is still talking about it and deciding to vote on it or not. And he'll come back and say, I've already done the job. Let's move on to the next thing. The beaver is the guy who speaks last at the, at the uh, church business meeting. And after we've discussed something for two hours, they'll raise their hands, say something, and everybody says, well, if you just said that earlier, we'd be done, right? Um, we've all got family members like this, right? You know who your otters are. You know who your beavers are. You know who your golden retrievers are. Um, and, and because of that, when you get together for the holidays, not everybody is grieving the same way. Uh, not everybody will grieve the same way. So, I've given, therefore, I've, I've given you some of these, these reactions to grief. And what I'd like to do is, um, you should have ink pens on your table and stuff. What I'd like to do is take and grab a pen there. Take about two or three minutes to walk through, uh, kind of as I'm talking about them, um, the, these reactions to grief. And by the way, these are very normal, very common, very expected. If you check off half the things on this, on this page and the next page, uh, that's what I would expect of you, especially if your your loss has been within the last year or so, um, or even two years. Um, you would expect something. So I'd like for you to check off all the things that you're still kind of experiencing at this point, okay, where you're at today. And uh, we'll just kind of walk through some of these fairly quickly, but you know, there's shock, there's there's numbness. Uh, maybe some of these were, were there, especially when you first heard about the loss or first experienced the loss, but maybe they've changed by now. Uh, some fear. What do we do now? The guilt, the helplessness, uh, resentment, maybe resentment at a hospital, resentment at some doctors, maybe resentment uh, towards the, the loved one that you lost, uh, some anxiety, uh, some anger, again, maybe anger at your loved one uh, that, they, that they died, and, or maybe how or why, um, maybe some depression, um, some just behavioral things, sleep disturbances. It's hard to sleep. If you were a caregiver for a long time for someone who died, uh, you probably didn't sleep for like two years, and getting back into the pattern of sleeping is is difficult. Uh, appetite disturbances, you're probably don't, not eating well. In one of my groups, I uh, had a lady who said, "I, I, um, I ever since I, my my husband died, she said I gained, or she said I've lost 40 pounds, and uh, just quit eating and didn't like cooking for one person. I've lost 40 pounds." Lady sitting right here next to her, she said, "Oh, honey, I found it." She said, "I." <laughs> I found your 40 pounds, and she said after her husband died, she didn't want to cook for one, so she would do the same thing every night. She would uh, come home from uh, work, and she stopped by the convenience store, and she bought a family-sized bag of Munchos potato chips, which, by the way, is one of my favorite potato chips, just so you know, if anybody wants to contribute to the to the Jeff O'Dell grief fund or whatever. Um, love Munchos potato chips. And she said I'd buy a king-sized bag of those, and, uh, and she said and I'd buy a two-liter bottle of Mountain Dew. And she said, I'm not sleeping very good either. I don't know why. <laughs> and uh, so we think we can help you a little bit. We've discovered some things here. Um, but she wasn't eating right. She wasn't sleeping right. Uh, sensing the deceased. Sometimes you just get a feeling that they're still there. Uh, just being restless. I need to be doing something, but I don't know what it is. Um, pulling away from people. Isolation. Social withdrawal. Crying. Obviously, there's been some tears. Uh, visiting or avoiding. And some people go different directions. You probably already have family members who go to the grave consistently, others who don't ever want to go there uh, that remind you of the deceased. Some people will eat at a restaurant because that was their loved one's favorite restaurant. Some people won't, just can't ever go back to that restaurant because it was, it was their loved one's favorite. Uh, on the next page, just some of the physical things there, fatigue. Uh, grief is hard, folks. It wears you out. 
Uh, you know that. If you're here today, you already know that it wears you out. It's tiring. It's exhausting. Maybe an adrenaline release may cause nausea or frenzied activity, um, fight or flight or freeze responses, weakness, feeling faint, um, increased reputations, chest pain, weight loss or weight gain, compromised immune system. Uh, many times we talk with people, they say, man, I've, I've been sick more since my loved one passed than I've ever been before. It's because we don't take care of ourselves. We don't eat well and our immune system becomes compromised. Um, a lack of motivation. I just don't feel like doing anything. Uh, then, then even spiritual things that come along and maybe a searching to make sense of all the why questions. For many, for many of you, maybe that's just kind of plagued you and you're even stopped there. You're stuck there. Um, I just don't understand why. Why, why, why? Um, searching for meaning and purpose, questioning, reexamining, or, or rejection of, of former beliefs about God. Uh, maybe it's really shaken your faith. All the things you believed about God to this point, now you're wondering, you know, What's God thinking? What's God doing? Does God even care? Uh, the inability to pray, to read scripture, or participate in worship, spiritual crisis. Maybe you're just at that point where I, I don't even know if I want to go to church anymore. And, and it makes total sense. Some more complicated spiritual grief stuff, that maybe a discord or conflict or distance from God and the faith and community. Feeling judged or misunderstood for being angry at or questioning God. This can happen. You share with somebody, you know, hey, I... Um, I'm really struggling with my faith. I'm really questioning God, and people condemn you for it. Oh, you can't do that. You can't, you can't talk to God that way. Um, anybody here ever read the Psalms? <laughs> Some of the questions God had, or uh, David had for God at times, um, he was kind of rough on him. And God never one time squashed him like a bug. God never criticized him. Uh, got on to him, told him he couldn't feel that way. Uh, maybe you feel lied to about God's character. Maybe there's some anger, confusion, distrust, spiritual abandonment. Uh, maybe feel like I'm being punished. Um, so you just stop sharing your true feelings and isolate emotionally and spiritually. Uh, for a lot of people, they just stop attending church at all or they change churches. I've had a lot of people tell me, I, I just can't go back to the same church. Me and my spouse sat in the same pew for 45 years and we've always been there and, and now it's just different. Or they were in a senior couples class and now they feel like the third wheel all the time and, and just, just feel so odd and different. Um, Again, what I want to remind you about all of these different reactions to grief, first of all, is that it's normal. That's commonplace. It's expected. Um, usually when I meet with somebody the first time, I'll give them these list of questions, and it's very common for them to check off about half of them. And, and then I have to remind them, this is, this is where I would expect you to be. Okay? People don't come to me because they've got all this stuff figured out in their life. They come to me because their world has been turned upside down, and, and they don't know what to do with it. So keeping that in mind, this year as you gather as a family, um, you're, you're gathering with family members who are in all of these places. And they're not going to look identical. Your pages, your check marks will look different, okay? They will, you know, some of you will say, well, I've been so fatigued. And others say, man, I, I just work all the time. Others will say, I, I don't want to get together for the holidays. Others will say, yes, I want to get together for the holidays. Some will say, I just want to do something small. Others will say, no, we need to honor granddad and really do it, you know, as big as we can this year because he's such a part. Um, so here's what I want, want you to do. I've given you some discussion questions there. I don't want you to kick around for just a little bit. And um, for about 15 minutes or so, I want to give you this time to discuss uh, amongst your table. Um, how many of the common reactions of grief did you check off? So I want you to count them up and actually look through. And if you've got, I don't know how many there are there. I didn't count them up. I changed this a little bit so my number wouldn't be exact. But there's, I know there's over 40, probably over 50. And if you checked off half of them, you're Okay. Okay, if you didn't check off any while we were talking, that's okay. You can do some of those now. Um, can you accept the fact that these are okay? These are normal and natural reactions to grief. Uh, who in your family grieves differently than you do? And any, any area of the reactions you checked off concerning to you? Sometimes people say, I, this one's really a problem for me. I, I sense the person or I have, you know, I see them visually sometimes. And is that concerning to you? Uh, if it is, you know, go ahead and voice that. It's okay. Uh, it shouldn't concern you because, again, because that's very normal and very natural. But um, talk about some of these things at your table. Some of your tables have table leaders. Others I um, it may just be uh, if you've got a smaller table and want to jump in with some other folks, you can. But uh, uh, the other tables I think I gave the discussion question to. And, uh, so take about 15 minutes. I'll kind of walk around. And if you've got any questions, you can, you can holler at me. Okay? We'll, um, we'll, we'll come back in here. I'll be... Um, I'll give you about 10 or 15 minutes to do this, okay?
Okay, let's, um, we'll do a couple things here before we take our first break, but um, first of all, I meant to read this little poem to you, and I forgot to do that, so I'm going to read it now. <clears throat> it's just called The Many Faces of Grief, and you might uh, hear some of your family members in this. It says, Robert still cannot sleep too well. He's awake from 2 a.m. Janet, Janet is the opposite and doesn't rise till 10. Sarah made a special card for each and every one. She did this sitting on the beach while soaking up the sun. Samuel went out to the shed in the middle of the night. He grabbed the axe and chopped the wood until it was first light. George took out his little boat and sailed across the bay. We may be family, we may be friends, but we each grieve in our own way. Peter flew off the handle. Anything set him off. Pat put a message in a balloon and gently set it aloft. Tui simply went to bed and hid under the sheets. She couldn't bear to leave the house. It's now been several weeks. Jane cleaned the entire house from room to room. She went till the house was cleaner than it had ever been, and all her tears were spent. Leo couldn't wash it all. He didn't shower for days. We may be friends or family, but we grieve in different ways. Mark just had to go to work to take his mind off things. Melissa walked to the park at dusk and sat quietly on the swings. Bethany went down to the gym. She didn't do this for fun. And if that didn't help ease her pain, she headed out for a run. Patricia looks like nothing's wrong, that not a tear was shed. Plenty have been, but no one knows. She only cries in bed. So please be kind and gentle when loved ones pass away, for each of us will be grieving in our own and special way. And that is so true. I've talked with people who have done all of those things, and people don't get it. They're like, well, they don't understand why I do this or why I do that. And so we do have to really be patient with family members. Uh, I want to touch on a couple of things. First of all, as I was walking around, I just uh, I heard the word guilt. And um, okay, if I could just briefly, because I wasn't going to get into it today, but just talk about the difference between guilt and regret. And I want to encourage you to... Um, not use the word guilt, but use the word regret when you're talking about those emotions and feelings. And here's why. Um, you know, unless you put a pillow over your loved one's head and smothered them, then you might be guilty, okay? Um, I'll grant you, but I don't think anybody in this room did, okay? Um, let me say this about death. It's almost always regretful, okay? Death seldom goes the way that you see it go on, death, on you know, touched by an angel. You know, very seldom do... Uh, the whole family get together around the bedside, and very seldom does the uh, um, do the lights get brighter and the angels sing ah, you know, and Roma Downey shows up and all that. That very seldom goes that way. Okay, I work in hospice, and I will tell you our our um, our um, our nurses will tell you that every single death is different, and very seldom are they the same, and it just doesn't always go the way we want it to go. Um, we don't, you know. Sometimes people say to me, I don't know how I'm going to react when I die. Of course you don't. We've never done it before, right? Um, and so we don't know how to even react during those times. And, and so my, my poise being is, is if, you know, there are many things to regret in death. Do you all remember a few years ago the, uh, when we got like a 15 inches of snow and then it was followed with like another foot of snow like two days later? We had just dug out and, and here it goes again. Trust me, I remember it well. I have a picture of myself standing with this pile of snow taller than my head. And um, I was working with a lady at the time who told me, she said, she told me when she came to the group, she said, I had promised my mother that I would be there to hold her hand when she took her last breath. She said, I told her that for seven years. Um, her mother was about a mile away from where she lived. We got that first batch of snow, the 15 inches or so. Uh, this woman did not live on a snow removal area, what do you call it, emergency snow route. And um, she tried to get her 4 by 4 Jeep out. She couldn't get it out. She tried to walk up to the facility where her mother's out. She couldn't get there because just the snow was so high. And you already, you already know where this story is going, right? Her mother died in those two days that she couldn't get up there. And she said, I feel so guilty. I feel so guilty. Listen, guilt or, or many things in death are regretful. It is regretful that that happened. It is regretful that it happened that way. It's regretful that if, if you lost a loved one at all, there's regret around that. Somebody told me one time, death is the most natural thing in the world. And I thought, no, it's not. It's the most unnatural thing in the world. We're created to live. We're not created to die. Death is just the thing that gets us to the next 
place we're going. It's, it's, death is the most unnatural thing. And again, we don't know how to do it. We've never, never done it before. We don't know how we're going to respond. The patient doesn't and the family doesn't. So I'm just trying to say, be, try to be nice to yourself and be a little more tender with yourself. And remember, you know, and I know all the ifs. Well, if I'd have known what this medicine was going to do, if I wish we'd listened to the doctor, if I just noticed if I'd gotten to, gotten to the doctor sooner. You know, we only know what we know, right? And we don't know what we don't know. And unless you're a doctor in here, even doctors miss things. Uh, I have a nephew who's, uh, uh, who is a pediatrician doctor, one of the top in his field. He worked for the Navy for several years. The Navy wanted him because he, was, he always graduated top of his class. Um, when, their, when their child was about seven months old, um, he was swinging in the swing. They just fed him breakfast, and he looked over, and the little boy wasn't breathing. He did CPR on him, and the baby died. He was a medical doctor three feet from his son playing with his other boys. And he said, why didn't I notice that? Well, because he didn't know he was going to stop breathing three feet from him. Okay? And that's regretful. It broke his heart. It broke our family's heart. But it happened. But he wasn't guilty. He wasn't guilty. He didn't do anything wrong. Okay? He fed him breakfast just like he'd fed him breakfast all the other mornings of the seven months. So I, I just say that because I wouldn't want anybody to leave here saying, but I just feel so guilty about I did this or I didn't do this or I wish I'd done this. The statement I hear more than anything is I wish I'd said something more, wish I'd done something more or uh, uh, done something better, more. Um, boy, I'm really messing up this statement I hear you all say all the time. Um, wish I'd said something better, said something more, said something different or done something more, done something better or done something different. And, and sure, that's always there, okay? But it, but it doesn't make you guilty, if you miss everything else I say today, I hope that would bring you a little bit of, little bit of peace. Um, any questions from the stuff we talked about at first in this first session? Mike's got a mic. He's going to be our mic running guy. Uh, we're doing this, and we'd like for you to speak on the mic if you do have a question because um, uh, we are videotaping this for folks who want to go back later and watch it. And you won't be on camera, okay? So, but we want you to be able to. We want to be able to record the question. Any questions for stuff we've talked about? Okay. Anybody? Wow. Means I'm either a really bad teacher or a really good teacher. So table leaders, they, they answered all the questions. Awesome. So um, then let's do this. Let's at least stretch, okay? Take a little restroom break, and we'll come back here at 10, get you some more donuts or whatever you want out there um, to, to uh, snack on. And at 10 o'clock, we'll jump into session two, Okay. Thank you.